Shamblin, USA. This meeting of the House Undead American Activities Committee will now be in order. Today, this committee, of which I am the chair, will be investigating the issue of undead Americans among our impressionable youth. Mr. Manager Mike, you have sworn an oath to this committee. I have but one question. Are you now, or have you ever, engaged in harboring the undead? I don't recall. Hello, my name is Cole Hornaday and welcome back to the Panel Jumper. American culture is but an infant compared to those from whence we came. As such, we can truly only claim a small sample of art forms as uniquely our own. Among them, jazz and comic books, both at one time marked as lowbrow and degenerate by the short-sighted and uninitiated. However, over the years, jazz has become widely celebrated as a musical genre that transcends societal boundaries, holding as much cultural validity in the lecture hall as the nightclub. By contrast, comic books still struggle to prove their artistic merit to the world at large. But comics hold a significant place in the zeitgeist, and as we'll see, are as American as they come. We will have silence in the gallery. 1947, William Maxwell Gaines inherits his father's comic book company, Educational Comics, a publisher known for their Bible, history, and science titles. Gaines soon changes the company name to Entertaining Comics. EC for short, and sets about crafting a company brand both captivating and subversive. 1950s post-war America found itself in a conspicuous period of prosperity, and for the first time in known memory, children reaped the benefit of the atomic family's surplus nickels and dimes. The country witnessed a publishing explosion with over 30 comic book companies grinding out anywhere between 80 to 100 million comics a month as publishers sought to exploit their younger market. EC alone carried over a dozen titles, ranging in themes from crime to horror, science fiction to suspense, and war to humor. The new stands were alive with titillating EC titles like Tales from the Crypt, Weird Science, Two-Fisted Tales, and Crime Suspense Stories. Taking their cue from radio dramas of the day, the EC Oeuvre were anthology-style compilations told with quick O'Henry-style twists and presented by Gaines' proud assemblage of some of the finest writers and illustrators of the era. Names that would become industry legends in the decades to come. I said be quiet! Now, Mr. Manager Mike, may I remind you that you are under oath? Okay, uh, well, it went down like this. It was close to closing time, and I'd heard on the radio that there were some undead Americans on the run. Bring this to you. The uh, suddenly this lady darts into my store, slamming the door shut. Well, good grief, lady, you can't bring those things in here. Don't you know there's a citywide ban? I had to find Sanctuary, the first safe place I could. Your wonderful comic book store. Gosh, you have such a fantastic selection of comics here, also incredibly reasonably priced. Mr. Manager Mike, please stick to the subject at hand. Uh, fine. Uh, she told me her name was Irma, and she rescued these three zombies from an angry mob and was looking to get them out of the city. She'd heard the rumor that they were terrible influences on our nation's youth, but she just saw it as overreaching fear-mongering by the short-sighted and uninitiated. Sir, thou hast pilfered my words. For Gaines and his stable of unsung geniuses, EC Comics became a creative sounding board for the country's seething post-war anxiety, bitterness, and dread. They offered up stories that took readers down many a morally ambiguous road by placing a higher value on their audience's intelligence than their competition. As the country made its hasty leap into the conflict with North Korea, the Red Scare was everywhere. All the commies needed was a fertile spot of soil in which to plant their wicked seed. Something like the lethal loam of juvenile delinquency. Riding the crest of this fatuous wave, Bavarian-born child psychologist Dr. Frederick Wortham made claim in his treatise, Seduction of the Innocent, that the comic book was a key catalyst in the corruption of conformity and the fall of American youth. Like Senator Joe McCarthy's paranoid charge that the commies had infiltrated U.S. Army posts and Hollywood film studios, a Senate subcommittee to investigate juvenile delinquency was formed, while comic book bonfires ignited across the countryside. 
Surprisingly, Wortham and the Senate subcommittee offered little concern over EC's science fiction, humor, and war stories, books often unabashedly critical of the current sociopolitical climate. No, it was EC's crime and horror tales that generated the greatest furor. And to be sure, EC's horror comics in particular were not for the faint of heart. And though they sported a decidedly tongue-in-cheek brand of humor, thanks to their lunatic hosts, the Old Witch, the Vault Keeper, and the Crypt Keeper, their stories frequently featured sizable servings of gore and entrails. Gaines knew he stood on a career gallows. He saw what the subcommittee meant to his industry and demanded his right to testify. In intent and effect, the comic book degrades the moral fiber of American youngsters. This seems to be a man holding a bloody axe, holding a woman's head up, which has been severed from her body. Would you say that is in good taste? Yes, sir, I do. For the cover of a horror comic. Comic books are sexually aggressive in an abnormal way and make violence alluring and cruelly heroic. Mr. Gaines, would you say there's any limit to what you would publish? My only limits are the bounds of good taste. The time has come to legislate these books off the newsstands and out of the candy stores. This seems to be a man with a woman in a boat strangling her with a crowbar. Is that in good taste? I think so. How could it be worse? Hitler was a beginner compared to the comic book industry. Gaines was incensed. He was also crashing. He'd taken prescription Benzedrine earlier in the day, but as the testimonies ran over time, his bennies had worn off and his balloon was tumbling to earth. His wits were in no shape for the subcommittee's interrogation. I could feel myself fading out. They kept pelting me with questions from all sides. I really wanted to fix those bastards, but instead I did Wortham's job for him. The next day, Gaines' testimony was plastered all over the front page of the New York Times while he lay in bed with stomach pains. Ultimately, Wortham's efforts led to the establishment of the Comics Code of Authority, the industry's self-censoring body. And for the first time in history, a pop entertainment medium was nearly regulated into oblivion. Thanks to Wortham's damning allegations and the astringency of the Comics Code, dozens of comic book publishers disappeared from the landscape by the mid-50s. As the work of most creators of the time went uncredited, it's difficult to calculate just how many writers and illustrators were left unemployed, but the number is estimated to be upwards of 1,000. Some publishers were determined to weather the sea change, opting to revisit the superhero genre, which had fallen out of fashion in the decade following the war. Publishers like DC Comics unpacked many of their retired 1940s-era heroes like The Flash, Hawkman, and Green Lantern from Mothballs, and gave them a newfangled lease aligned with the comics code. The stage was now set for what became known as the Silver Age of Comics, thusly rooting a genre that would dominate the industry for generations to come. For all the damage he did the industry, Wortham meant well. He truly believed his cause was just and American children should be protected from harmful influences. He also spoke out about the blatant female objectification found in many comics, calling for a greater respect for women as women, and that not merely it's sex objects to be bandied about or luxury prizes to be fought over. This was probably one of the most tragic and infuriating things about EC Comics. For all the progressive and provocative storytelling found in their science fiction, humor, and war stories, EC's crime and horror comics were a sad reflection of the era's rampant sexism and misogyny. The truth is, Wortham and I weren't all that different. He wanted children to grow into mentally healthy adults. I got that, trust me. I was a publisher. Pleasure is what I sold. Entertainment, reading enjoyment. Entertaining reading never harmed anybody. Our American children are bright children, but those that want to prohibit comic magazines seem to see dirty, sneaky, perverted monsters that use comics as a blueprint for action. Perverted little monsters are few and far between, and they don't read comics. EC Comics struggled to observe the Comics Code dictates by replacing their entire line with innocuous titles like Psychoanalysis, MD, and Valor. Sadly, they didn't stand a chance in a political atmosphere that saw them as the products of a bunch of morally bankrupt perverts. EC Comics was eventually starved out of the marketplace, with all their titles dying on the vine save one. A book Gaines and editor Al Feldstein had the foresight to risk modifying into a magazine format, moving it to the shelves above the comics while keeping it below the radar of the comics code. The one subversive comic that any totalitarian regime would throw on the bonfire first and foremost. Mad Magazine. What? Me worry? Harumph. Mr. Manager Mike, in the interest of time, will you portray for us the details of the events after you decided to break the confines of the comic book store and rush the undead to freedom? Yes, ma'am. Um, I had been convinced that 
uh, staying in the back issue room of the store was not a permanent solution. Uh, and if I'm honest, I didn't feel safe myself. So I decided to escort the undead and their keeper out the back to the relative safety of the alley below and send them on their way. The same reason these poor leathery souls shambled into mine. It's fate, manager, Mike. The ugly stories you hear about the undead aren't true. They're not cannibals. They're more like lilies. Lilies that walk and walk and walk until they can't walk anymore, but it does not mean they don't have feelings. Thank you for everything. Your help has been noted by the Resistance, and you will be rewarded graciously. I don't need a reward. Just tell him to come buy some comics. Hey! I'm just... Uh, I'm just gonna go this way. And that was the last I saw of them. And they have not attempted to contact you at all? No, sir. In that case, we will adjourn these sessions for today. Mr. Manager Mike, your testimony has been noted and you are excused. Following the Senate subcommittee hearings, the entire comic book industry succumbed to a rigorous policing by the Comics Code. As a result, comics became stultified, quashing the art form's potential for generations and labeling it a lowbrow medium only suitable for children and the weak-minded. Unlike the majority of their competitors, EC Comics have more advanced aesthetic that has proven the test of time. Since the 1970s, EC Comics have seen regular reprints and glossy hardbound editions, and between 1989 to 1996, HBO adapted Tales from the Crypt into a highly successful TV series. Over overlapping with the 1993 ABC animated series, Tales from the Crypt Keeper, targeted at younger audiences. I think that's what we call irony, folks. What? No, oh, oh God, no. Oh, okay. You're welcome, guys. Okay, okay, okay. Let's get back. Oh, God, what am I gonna do with you? Um, oh, hey, uh, free comic book day's coming up pretty soon. I can always use more volunteers. You guys up for some nerd wrangling? Okay. All right. I wonder if I can get a deal on some zombie muzzles and flesh tone spackle. Uh, well, for now, though, let's get you some fresh clothes. Wortham wasn't the first to suggest that comic books could destroy the moral fiber of American youth, <laughs> nor to be the last. In 2013, a review of Wortham's research found that the data he submitted in Seduction of the Innocent was flawed. He misinterpreted his own findings and falsified his results. Thousands of young interviewees were actually hundreds. Quotations were spliced and attributions muddied. Some details he invented outright. Comic books, like all art forms, hold a mirror up to nature, reflecting who we are as a culture. Our fears and anxieties, joys and triumphs, foibles and flaws. As the United States marched into the Cold War, it did many readers a world of good to take a long, hard, four-color look at what our funny books said about ourselves. You see, sometimes, when you hold that mirror up to nature, the reflection appears in panels. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on The Panel Jumper. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to us on YouTube. Visit us at thepaneljumper.com and check out our Patreon account.